So next up, we have Christian Newman, for uh, last for the hour here, uh, who's going to talk about how we can craft strong identifier names. Christian, educate us. All right. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Great. Uh, so my name is Christian. I'm the head researcher at the Scano Laboratory. So if you enjoy what we talk about today, please feel free to visit our website, which you can find at the bottom of this slide, scano.org. So today I wanted to talk to you about identifier names. And so on this slide, you see several different types of identifiers. Some of them have one or two different words in them. Some of them have prepositions. Um, but a lot of them probably seem a little familiar to you because you've probably seen identifiers that look like these or perhaps even identifiers that look exactly like these. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we're talking because we're going to discuss why some of these look familiar to you um, as we go through. Um, so one question I wanted to ask about these is, well, are they good identifiers? And if we kind of scan back here, you'll probably look at this list. You'll say, ah, maybe, you know, it depends. I like, could look at the code and you might come to some conclusion. But the point here is that we would have to talk about it as developers. We'd have to perform code reviews. We'd have to look at the code. We'd have to come to some collective conclusion about the quality of these. And so identifier naming is at least partially subjective. It depends on the person that's reading it and on the code context and what the person is trying to convey. There's no objective quality metric for what makes a high quality identifier, um, but we've all seen it, right? So everybody's looked at some code and they've been like, ah, this, I don't, I don't know what this is doing. Why did they do it that way? What does PCL mean? Why is this a single letter? I don't understand what this is. I hate Hungarian. Why are they using Hungarian? Why is there an alphabet in front of my identifier? Um, so we know bad identifiers when we see it, even if we don't always know exactly why it's bad or what makes it a bad identifier. Um, we've all seen something that just made us kind of, you know, cringe. So um, a metric or some way of being able to understand the quality of these would be very useful. It could tell us, instead of us having to talk about it, we could look at the metric and the metric says, hey, you know, this is good. And it could give us some reasons for why it's good. And we might, you know, look at those and say, okay, I understand why it's named that way now. It makes sense. Okay, great. Um, Unfortunately, making a metric for this is very difficult, right? There are different, and one of the big reasons for this is that there are different perspectives that each identifier has to satisfy. You could be talking to a student or an expert or a senior developer, and each of these groups needs a different kind of identifier. And a senior understands the idioms and the, and the, um, the terminology and the different uh, grammatical structure of identifiers that software engineers use, whereas a student has never seen it before. Um, and, I, and I want you to pay attention to that because students don't understand the language of software development, whereas a senior does. And there's something important there because what I'm saying here is that we've created a language for ourselves internal to the software development community, which is how we convey the meaning of software to one another. And people outside of that community don't understand what we're talking about using this, even though they might speak the same human language as we do. So they might all speak English, but they don't understand what we're talking about. Um, but program comprehension is critically important. Um, it's the thing that we have to do before you do anything else. If you're going to add a feature, if you're going to fix a bug, you need to understand the software. So we actually really should be paying attention to this to this phenomena. Okay, so what makes this hard? Well, over the course of of decades, we as developers have created this sub language, and the sub language is based on a human language. Um, so for a lot of us, that would be English, but it can be other human languages as well. And this sub language specializes English into certain grammatical phrases and idioms that we use to describe software, to describe the behavior of software. Um, on top of that, this is 70% of the code. So if you look at the, the characters in the code, 70% of all characters in the code are in identifiers. And so if you don't understand that sub language that we're using, then you don't understand the code. You can't read it. It's a foreign language to you, essentially. Um, and, we, and the other thing to realize here is that we didn't design this language, but we did create it. Right. So as developers, we all evolved this language over time to deal with historical context. So, for example, old languages used to limit the number of characters that you could use to to, to create a variable. This forced us to have to use much shorter speech to say the same amount of text that you would say in a sentence. Right. Um, so we, we created this, but we didn't design it up front. We didn't come up with its rules. Um, we had to evolve it to, to deal with our jobs and our in our education. Um, so. The thing that 
uh, my lab is trying to do is study this sublanguage. So understand what are the rules that we have collectively curated over time so that we can make the rules explicit so that everybody understands what they are. Um, find ways to measure and describe the effect that these rules have on comprehension um, for different types of readers. So for novices versus experts, for example, and use this understanding to create better name creation, appraisal and maintenance uh, uh, approaches. So I wanted to talk to you today about one particular approach, and that's an approach that my lab has been studying a lot lately, which is grammar patterns. Uh, the way that you get a grammar pattern is you take an identifier, so you can see two on the screen here. Um, you apply a splitter. The splitter splits these identifiers into their constituent words, and then you apply a sparse speech tagger um, that is specialized for the context of software. Because remember, because software follows a different grammatical structure, you can't just take an off-the-shelf part of speech tagger. You you need to use specialized uh, NLP techniques to deal with these things. Um, and what we did was we did a study where we took a lot of code and we looked through um, how this code, or we looked through the identifier name structure for all of these codes. So we collected a bunch of grammar patterns and we looked at um, how they were being used in the software. And so I want to take a quick look at this. Um, if you scan down in this little catalog, what we did was we... Um, we basically took the taxonomy and we listed out every single pattern that we found. So these are grammatical structures. Um, so the first one here is a noun phrase. What a noun phrase is, is a sequence of noun modifiers um, followed by a head noun. And so we can see examples of that down here where we have the head noun label. Uh, the head noun typically represents ex what the what the entity, what the variable actually is is trying to convey in the code. And then the words that come to the left, the noun modifiers are descriptive. So they they function as adjectives. Um, in fact, noun modifiers are what we call noun adjuncts, which are effectively nouns that are posing as adjectives. And so in this case, what we have is a label that is specifically a selection with label. So this is a descriptive of the type of label that we're talking about. If we go down, we'll see prepositional phrases. Prepositional phrases tend to be um, identifiers that deal with, for example, um, conversion, so converting to a string or performing some kind of an event, so like on click, on button press, that kind of stuff. Um, and so what I want you to kind of get, since we don't have enough time to go through all of these, is that different patterns correlate to different types of behavior in the software. And so really what we're looking at here is a glimpse of this sublanguage that I've been kind of talking about up to this point. Um, we, we've created these patterns of speech um, that allow us to convey behavior very quickly to one another without having to be very explicit about what what nuances there are uh, under the text. There's a lot of subtext here. Um, and so these are some of the basic natural language phrasal structures that we as developers have created over the last um, 50, 100 years or whatever. Um, so um, what we did with these is we created a, a little bit of a tool. This is just kind of an, an, an initial way to start trying to address the problem. And what this tool does is it looks at the grammar patterns in your code, um, and it looks at some of the some of the surrounding code, and it gives you a recommendation. So in this case, uh, we have the variable characters. Um, our tool sees that the type of this is singular, so it's character. Um, and it's recommending that you not use a plural, but instead use a singular noun. So basically, make this character singular instead of characters. Um, and so that's just a quick example of what this tool does. And um, note here that it gives examples of what it's talking about when it gives these patterns and also an explanation, which are two things that we think are very, very important for these types of tools. Um, so our goal for this work in the future is to fully explore the diversity of grammar patterns. So we, there are more of these we want to find out how many of these exist so that we can, again, make them explicit. We want to create data-driven naming guidelines. So this is sets of measurements that can look at different aspects of the identifier name. Does it contain abbreviations? Does it contain domain terminology, et cetera? Um, and we want to make these so that we can understand how they affect the human reading it. Because if, Because, again, if you don't understand who is trying to read the code, then you can't give a metric that tells you how easy it is for them to read it. Um, if I don't know who's looking at this, then I can't tell you if this is a good identifier for them or not. Um, and then we want to create a framework that optimizes or that helps us optimize names that prioritizes the reader and explainability. So uh, another core tenant to this is that if you can't explain to people why this is good or bad or, or what is good or bad about it, then they can't make good decisions about whether this is a recommendation that they should be taken. So if we just give them a black box that tells them what the best thing is, they 
they won't be able to tell me if this is good or bad because they don't know why the box is recommending that um, that particular uh, pattern to them. Um, and so and our last goal is obviously educating developers at all levels about this language so that they can um, correctly express themselves when they're or so they can express themselves as optimally as possible to others when they're writing code. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you're uh, again, if you're interested, you can visit our website at scandal.org. Um, the little QR code takes you to our uh, our the name structure catalog, which also contains links to papers in our webpage. If you're uh, if you're looking to find those, um, and that's it. Thank you.